Yeah, tell me when. The Lord be with you. Welcome to worship this morning with the St. Charles Avenue Baptist Church. Each of you here in this space and each of you wherever you are um, joining us by Zoom today. I invite you to join me in reading our call to worship this morning. It's printed before you. I will begin in the light print and then you read the bold. We gather together in the presence of our shepherd God who calls us each by name, who restores our souls, who leads us in the way of righteousness, and whose goodness and love never stop pursuing us. The one who has created us, who sustains us, who redeems us, who walks beside us in good times and bad, and who calls us to follow. This is our God. Let's worship God together. 
The invocation this morning is prepared by John Vanderlaar, um, and I found this at his website where he posts his sacred writings and his spiritual songs. Would you join me? Good Shepherd, teach us to follow you, to care for all that are close to us, to protect those who are threatened, to welcome those who are rejected, to forgive those who are burdened by guilt, to heal those who are broken and sick, to share with those who have little or nothing, to take the time to really know one another and love as you have loved us. Good Shepherd, teach us to follow you, to spread compassion to those who are far away, to speak for those who are voiceless, to defend those who are oppressed and abused, to work for justice for those who are exploited, to make peace for those who suffer violence, to take the time to recognize our connectedness and to love as you have loved us. Good Shepherd, teach us to follow you and to be faithful to the calling you gave us and to be shepherds in your name. Amen. <laughs> first reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, the chapter uh, 10, and we'll be doing verses 1 through 10. And if you'd like to follow, this is on your Pew Bible, page 382. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used his figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. 
The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. As you are able and comfortable this morning, please stand with me as we pray together our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Gentle shepherd, you guide us in right paths. You lead us in the ways of love, even when we allow our anger, our rage, our greed, and at times even hate to direct our paths. We overreact, we take more than our share, we envy others that seem to have it all. Forgive us, God, for not following your ways. Forgive us for not remembering that we are your sheep and you are our shepherd. Forgive us when we have not listened for your voice and instead have acted as though we are utterly alone. Guide us back to your loving path, the path of loving you and loving our neighbors and loving ourselves. Help us to unclench our fists and extend our hands in hope and healing, forgiveness and love. In the name of Christ, our shepherd, we pray. Amen. Friends, in love and compassion, God calls us back to the beauty that is deep within our souls. By God's grace, we are made whole. Alleluia. Amen. And now may the God of new life restore and make new our life together. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us share signs of God's peace with one another.
Our second scripture reading for this morning comes from the book of Psalms, the 145th Psalm, verses 10 through 18. If you would like to follow along on your pew Bible, that's on page 506. The psalmist writes, All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to all people your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all God's words and gracious in all God's deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, O Lord, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, O Lord, satisfying the desire of every living thing. The Lord is just in all God's ways and kind in all God's doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all, on, to all who call on God in truth. Amen.
One of my favorite passages of scripture will come up in just a little bit as our third reading. It's been a favorite since I was a teenager, and I remember underlining it and highlighting it in my Bible. In Ephesians 3, chapter 20, we hear about the one who is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. And I think of that phrasing every time we come to this point in our worship where we give whatever it is that we can, trusting that when we give together, there is one who is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. Will our ushers come forward as we prepare ourselves for this time of giving? Let us give in the spirit of hope, trusting that there is one who is at work in us even now. I invite you to join me in a mindset of prayer, creating some spaciousness here. We have physical spaciousness, but maybe some spaciousness of grace in our bodies and between each other. Let's hold some silence together, and then I will bring us into a spoken word of prayer. Let us pray. For Libya, for Ukraine, for Russia, for Maui, for Morocco, 
for Louisiana, for New Orleans, for the nearly 80 children being removed from Angola by court order, for the 57 people on death row in Louisiana, for friends in the midst of a custody battle, for the ones who are in a battle with their own minds, for the ones with a new diagnosis, for the ones recovering, for the ones grieving, for the ones who are delighting, for the new child being formed in its mother's womb, for the beauty of this day, for the grace of friends gathered in a circle of love, we pray. We pray that your spirit draw near to us all, just as near as our own breath in our lungs. We pray that you, our source and our guide, might hide us beneath your wings of love, where we might just rest for a little while. We pray that Jesus the Christ might inspire us even now to live in love and peace with our neighbors, in love and peace with ourselves, in love and peace with you, O oh God. It is with the steps of Christ before us, the Spirit's breath within us, and the love of God around us, that we are bold to live just as we are bold to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
never preach in a t-shirt here. We're a very formal bunch. But my t-shirt this morning says love, and it is the t-shirt, the official kind of logo of my friend Brian Johnson's life right now. Brian is my pastor friend and guru. Um, he calls me his first disciple now, which I think is fantastic, um, who has ALS. And he is no longer able to speak, but he can type with his eyes. And the thing he types most consistently is an all lowercase love. So they made these t-shirts for us to remember the Johnson family, the seven of them living in Mid-City. I wore this shirt today because Brian, to me, embodies and encompasses the love of God in a way that I don't know I've ever ex experienced in another human being. It's a, lot of, it's a lot of pressure to put on somebody. But I thought I'd bring him with me into the pulpit today. So we move to Ephesians 3, again, my teenage favorite, because I was a church kid, beginning in verse 14. <clears throat> My response is to kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you and your inner being with power through his spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you who are being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Reach out and experience the breadth. Test its length. Plumb the depths. Rise to the heights. Live full lives, full in the fullness of God. Know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to the one who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. When Rosemary Kaufman was moving out of her house on Lower Line Street, she began giving away things she loved to people she loves. I was lucky enough to be invited to her home one day as she and her sister Mary were sorting through what to keep and what to donate. I ended up with a funny variety of things, a few slotted spoons, her jazz fest chair, an amazing black plastic bin that is perfect for gardening and potting plants and schlepping around the yard. Then she took me onto the sun porch off of her kitchen and picked up a green glass footed bowl with a variegated pothos plant trailing down from it. I assured her that she could take that to Lambeth House with her, but she was in a purging mood as we get sometimes, and she wanted me to have it while she started fresh. So I took her pothos home, sat it on a shelf and watched it grow and grow and grow. It got to the point that the trailing vines were so cumbersome, I decided to whack off a couple of feet in length. Of course, I didn't throw away what I'd pruned. I simply stuck the ends in a jar and let them be. Pothos is an amazingly forgiving plant. That's why restaurants often have them hanging around. And unlike a hydrangea or a cutting from a citrus tree, pothos will begin to put out roots in water from pretty much any cut piece you stick in there. So in no time at all, I had a second plant now trailing down a bookshelf. It seems counterintuitive, doesn't it, to cut off a plant, to slash the vines and wound the connections to the root and soil. It seems the thing should be almost near death. Something amazing and miraculous happens as that cutting plunges into compost or water. Where there was wound, roots now grow. 
And in a matter of weeks, that small piece of plant is now a new plant of its own, ready to be potted on and established for a life of its own. Watching roots form is nothing short of a miracle every time. Of course, the plant that now grows is not a new plant at all. You don't take a cutting of a pothos and get a rose bush. The cutting that is rooted and established is reflected, is reflecting the plant from which it was taken. And once the roots have formed, you continue to nourish those roots if the plant has any hope of living. In this letter to the church at Ephesus, written by Paul or a teacher writing in Paul's tradition, the prayer for the fledgling church is that they will be rooted and established in love. And the writer understands it's a process. It isn't finished. In fact, the author writes, as you are being rooted and established in love. It's a grammatical nuance, but it's telling us this isn't finished work. Some translations do choose to word it that way. That's why I pulled together three different ones this morning. You are rooted. You are established. It's different than you are being rooted. You are in the process of growing roots. You are becoming established, but not there yet. There is a progressing, evolving work in us and through us to become people of love. You are to be rooted and established in love to reflect the ways of Christ Jesus. You, being rooted and established in love, will expand into the abundant love of Christ. These are promises, but not just the promise of a love for you or for our inner circle here. This is a love that expands throughout the world. This is a love that moves throughout every family in heaven and on earth, in fact, connecting you, us, to all the saints, all the other ones who are tracking and stumbling and making their way on the way. You will discover it only gets deeper. It only stretches wider. It only reaches higher, this love. To speak of love in this way sounds so sweet, so hallmarky, and I fear you can't hear what I'm saying, and I am running out of time. I really do deeply, so truly believe this. In fact, there isn't a whole lot I believe anymore in the sense of make, staking my life on it. But as the things I have come to believe have whittled down to very few, the ones I now hold on to are increasingly unshakable. And the most essential of them being the way of love. And I don't mean sloppy sentimentalism. This isn't casual in the flippant way we love ice cream and we love a TV show and we love the collard green melt at Turkey and the Wolf, even though we are right to love it so. This way of love is deeper and bigger and wider. It is an abiding love. It grows in and around you. And as you are being rooted and established in love, you will begin to change. You will evolve. All that stuff I said last week about the fruits of the Spirit, it really does happen if you give yourself to it. Love will make you more patient and kind. It will change the questions you ask about your neighbors and the world. Love will become your guide to considering injustice and inequity in this world. Love will even accompany you inward to the lifelong tending and healing work of loving yourself. This is why Jesus couldn't be trapped by the question about what the greatest commandment might be. No question, no hesitation, it's love. Love God, love your neighbor, Love yourself. 
as you are being rooted and established in love, you will come to know how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. As you are being rooted and established in love, you will more readily respond to your neighbor with empathy and grace and patience. Even the neighbor who edges his lawn and blows the debris away at 7 a.m. on a Saturday. Even the politician who makes your blood boil and your skin crawl. Abiding love, if we stick with it, can extend even to them. And as you are being rooted and established in love, of course, that loving kindness will turn inward, just as the great meta practice teaches. May you be safe. May you be healthy. May you know love. May you live with ease. The meditation teachers instruct us to imagine concentric circles around us, and the farthest ring out is someone you may pass regularly but do not really know. Your letter carrier, the barista at your usual coffee shop, the woman who takes your $3 at the parking deck. And as you imagine them, you share these words in your heart. May you be safe. May you be healthy. May you know love. May you live with ease. And we come in a circle to someone we already hold deep affection for, a neighbor, a friend, a family member, someone who could use the attention and energy of our loving kindness practice. May you be safe. May you be healthy. May you know love. May you live with ease. Move one circle closer and the work gets a little harder. This is where the neighbor with a leaf blower comes in. Think of someone with whom maybe you have a conflict, someone from whom you are estranged, someone you find it more difficult to feel love for lately. May you be safe. May you be healthy. May you know love. May you live with ease. And then at last, we come to perhaps the most difficult one of all. Here at the center, we find ourselves being rooted and established in love. We want to reside here, right there in the midst of that loving kindness, radi radiating out from me. I now turn it inward toward all of who I am. And that's the shiny parts and the shadows. May you be safe. May you be healthy. May you know love. May you live with ease. But if that was our central practice and central tool and guide for how we approach and engage each other in the world, that isn't what church has been known for. And it doesn't necessarily produce programs. It isn't quick and easy. It's hard work that takes a lifetime, and it's not a quick band-aid to last the day. This is the way to which I hope and pray I am giving myself. It isn't easily quantifiable. It does not make for a good spreadsheet or an end-of-year report. I say that because I know that's what some people want. So some will say I gave up on the church. Some will say, I did not prioritize numeric growth. Some will even say, I let Sunday school die and did not fight for the traditional ways of gathering and being church together. I hear the comments. I just don't feel a burning need to respond. After all the thousands and thousands of words I've preached, I sure do hope you'd know me better than that by now. Love is really all I have left to say. As I leave this place, you can think what you will about my decade as pastor. It's true that at some point along the way, my energy shifted from what I found to be the frenetic place of worrying about the state of the church in America 
to asking, what does it mean to be a person who desires to be rooted and established in love? And for better and for worse, my hope has been that anyone who desires to be rooted and established in love will come alongside me and I alongside them. I decided I would go deep in the narrow place where I stood rather than reaching wide and staying shallow, which is what I have found the purple church in America to do. Maybe you can do both. I could not. Going deep into the ways of love, so fully revealed in Jesus the Christ, has brought out fire in me. And you've seen it, and you've heard it, and sometimes you have loved it, and sometimes you have not. It has brought out fire in me, and we've talked about immigration disparities, children crossing the southern border alone, full LGBTQIA inclusion in the church and the world, and the healing and repairing work that needs to happen because of the damage the church has caused to LGBTQIA people by not being loving. The realities of the carceral state, undrinkable water in Flint, Michigan and Jackson, Mississippi, the unfair treatment of the poor and people, for, people of color in our world, in our nation, in our region, in our state, in our city, the realities of our participation in and ongoing benefit of white supremacy, the terrifying impact of climate change. I've talked about all of these things and more, and I know it's a lot. Believe me, I do. It is a lot for me, too. But you see, I preached Jesus week in and week out here in this pulpit. And I do not see how you can study the teachings of Jesus and not end up there. So some said I got too political and I made it too hard for a wide variety of people to come to church. Maybe that's true. I can take that criticism because I do not know any other way to be a person of love in the world without aching in my body for that love to transform this world. I do not know how to say I am giving myself to love, asking for spirit to shape me for the loving path without actively working for love, believing that we can make a new world out of this old one. I believe that's why we have these letters to the early church in our canon. Sure, they are bizarre and there are some antiquated teachings and there are phrases lost to time that we really can't quite make sense of today in 21st century English. And so some dismiss Paul and the epistles altogether for those reasons. But as I've been sitting with them in these final weeks here as your pastor, I've asked myself, what is the essence of these letters? It's these loving words from teachers and pastors to their people. You little gathering of quirky believers, grace and peace to you. You're surrounded by a world that tells you it's not just okay to be selfish, but it's expected. A world that says never put too much trust in your friends, but learn to manipulate your enemies. You're saturated by a world that tells you to put yourself first, to get ahead at all costs, to play chess with the people around you so you can get your way and take the credit. You're inundated with messaging that deception to get to the top and hoarding to get the most is just the way the game works. And the ones who hoard the most are the winners of the game. But don't believe it. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You can be different than they are. You can hold to different values. You can cultivate different standards and measure of what success is. You can create a community where all are equal and valued. You can hold space for people to tell the truth about their lives and to be met with compassion and grace. But it won't just happen. That's why it doesn't just happen. 
You and I, we have to choose this over and over again. We have to choose to plant ourselves in the way of love until we at last are rooted and established in it. I can't make you hear me. And I certainly can't make you believe me. But know that I really do believe all of this to be most essentially true. Love is the way. Love is the path. Love is the answer. Love is the source. Love is the end. Love is the flow. Love is the guide. Love is the metric. Love is that mysterious thin space in which we live and move and have our being. I pray that out of God's glorious riches, God may strengthen you in your inner being with power through the Spirit. And that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, as you are being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Reach out and experience the breadth, test its length, plumb the depths, rise to the heights, live full lives, full in the fullness of God. Know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all fullness of God. Now to the one who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. In way of announcements for this morning, um, for those of you who are guests with us this morning, know that we do have refreshments immediately behind you afterwards. We will gather after the benediction, uh, and you're very welcome to join us back there for that. Um, also know that following the refreshments, there will also be a business meeting, and so you are welcome to maybe 10 or 15 minutes or so. We will regroup here um, in the sanctuary in this part of the space and we will attend to that business of the church. 
Um, tonight, we are in partnership with NOLA Wesley Campus Ministry. Um, you know what that is. We need all the food to arrive. If you are volunteering to bring something for that meal with the campus ministry, please have that there by 4.45 p.m. We'll have a meal at 5 in worship afterwards. In other announcements, um, I want to be clear about Wednesday night. This Wednesday night, our meal is at 6 p.m. 6 p.m. this Wednesday night, September 20th. And then, given Elizabeth's transition and other transitions that are happening, we're going to rest for a couple of Wednesdays, and then we're going to come back in early October. And there will be plenty of space in between now and October the 11th, I think I've said. Um, we will bump the meeting time for that dinner back to 5.30, which is what we've done in the past in various stages. And we'll do that so that we have time for a few programming between the start of dinner and choir practice at 7. So we'll eat around 5.30, um, and then around 6 or so, I will be leading a book study, which I'll talk about more in the upcoming weeks. That's in different um, announcements, uh, so you can read more about that. It's on the e-bulletin if you click that email that came through. And um, Paul Powell has told me about a rich history of the, some who like to gather in the chapel to sing hymns and to do other things. And so we will have, not everybody is going to want to read the book, and that's okay. Uh, so we'll have that option as well. Um, and so those who want to gather and do that in the chapel on Wednesdays um, up until time for choir practice to begin, that will be there as well. This upcoming Sunday, of course, is Elizabeth's last Sunday, and so we have some celebratory plans for that. We will, I believe the plan is to go to the fellowship hall afterwards and um, enjoy our time with Elizabeth there after that last worship service. And then lastly, Nancy Sanders has been around this morning with some printed out cards. On Saturday, September 30th, our congregation is partnering with Blue Cypress Books to uh, let's say, promote our concern for the integrity of the pursuit of the life of the mind. How about that? We are having a banned book fair <laughs> in light of a lot of the attempts to ban books in various states and places around our country. We want to, uh, because this does inform how we approach faith and how we approach um, our own spiritual lives here at St. Charles and our history, we want to stand in solidarity with uh, all efforts that are being made to always promote that sort of free access um, and intellectual inquiry. So that's a lot. Please take your bulletin with you. You have it here. Um, check your email. It's all there. Uh, we're glad you're here. Plug in where you would like to plug in, and we will go from there. Elizabeth. It's good to be here with you today. It's nice to see some familiar faces who've not been around uh, a lot lately or who have been in other places. I'm grateful for your presence here in worship today, and I look forward to being back here with you next week as we have a celebratory transition Sunday and say, see you soon is how we're going to do it. And until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen.